It's Don here from the board. Thanks for coming along and checking out this video. Today's video is going to be a look at one of my latest projects where I kind of go back to the basics of electronic design and development testing, that kind of thing. It's something that I haven't really done a lot of because I haven't really had to do a lot of, but uh, it's, I suppose, elementary electronic skills that I was actually taught in high school science and, and did a bit of it at university and physics classes as well. But what I'm talking about, which of course the title of this video no doubt would have said, is I'm looking at using a breadboard to build and test a circuit for a particular project in mind. So let's get right down onto the desktop and see what I'm talking about. There we have it. Now, for those who might not be very familiar with uh, sort of core electronics design and development from the very very early days on in the history of what breadboards was all about this is a typical breadboard now I do have another one which doesn't have stuff on it uh, so these ones are pretty old they I think they were from my dad's time uh, back overseas and, and we just somehow had them over here with us and essentially what a breadboard is, is it's like a matrix of interconnected holes. The actual term, oh, just dropped some socket bits there. The actual term of a breadboard was that back in the days when people were starting in early electronics, it was actually done with pegboards that had these long poles and wires that had to be wrapped around these poles to connect components. And they're called uh, hand wraps. Um, they required tools that would actually bind wiring to the posts for I think typically around seven winds with enough tension on it that it provided excellent redundancy in electrical connections. If you have a look at some very historical boards out there, circuit boards and systems and whatnot, they're all built with these massive backplanes that have these hand wrapped uh, connections. But a lot of people who were enthusiasts and trying to learn electronics at the time didn't have the finances to get those pegboards as well as the tools uh, and the posts and things like that. It was very, very expensive. And so home enthusiasts would actually get screws and get wooden breadboards, actual cutting boards for bread, and they would just screw the screws into the board and pinch their wires into that. And that's where the phrase comes from. A modern breadboard looks like this, and you'll see it has rows and columns, not dissimilar to a keyboard matrix, I suppose. But the difference is that these rows and columns are interconnected in a very different fashion. So uh, I don't really have a pointing tool. I should be probably more prepared. Uh, so each one of these rows on each of these halves are actually electrically interconnected. Now, if I take this up here, you'll see that there are some references. So it says A all the way down to E, and then F all the way down to J, and then that's the column headers, and then there's rows, which of course, 1, 5, 10, and so on and so forth. So this center pitch is often called the ravine. This gap basically breaks up these two major columns, and each minor column in between. These two columns on the outsides are your power rails. Now, I have these socket bits here that I kind of dropped out of the box. You can see that they're actually screwed into this one, but they're not doing anything. But what you would do is you would actually jack a power supply into those sockets, and then you can connect those to your power rails. So you can provide voltage to whatever it is that you're testing. So each one of these rows are interconnected, but they're not connected across the ravine. And these columns are how you would separate components. Now, I'm talking about rows and columns, and it does sound a little bit tricky, but this hole is connected to this hole, connected to this hole, connected to this hole, connected to this hole. No connection across the gap, and then similarly across that entire row. But they're not connected down the rows within that column. So if you wanted to connect a component, to another component, you would have one leg into this hole, and the other component would also be in this hole, and it would form that electrical connection. So you can have up to five different items socketed in that would be all electrically connected. But then the other end of that would require a different row, otherwise 
you're, you're going to get a weird part of uh, your circuit being built. So you do have to think very spatially and you do have to have a map out of what you're trying to achieve in the breadboard. And it doesn't mean that you can't use multiple breadboards because you can get small ones, you can get big ones and things like that. Now this has a standard 2.54 millimeter or a point, um, what is it, point 0.1 of an inch pitch in the spacing which is pretty standard for a lot of electronic components and it perfectly fits the Pro Micro as well. So let's just put that aside for the moment. Put this aside. Okay, I'll deal with those bits later. Now, what exactly is the project that I have put together here that I want to show and demonstrate is that with my macro pads idea at work, I have my big switch with a PCB that I designed as a single press function. So when I hit it, it outputs Windows plus L, which is the lock screen command. So when I get up from my terminal from work to get a cup of coffee, to go to the photocopier, to go to the bathroom, whatever, I hit that button, bam, it locks my machine. So it's a security measure. It's good practice. I have colleagues who have taken that idea and they've purchased Pro Micros from me and they've made arcade buttons with a little 3D printed housing, which is really cool. So they can just, you know, hit it. It's even got an LED inside it. It's five volt driven and it glows. So it's kind of like a reminder of, hey, when you get up, hit that button, lock your computer. Some people in our workplace use multiple terminals. So we have our own uh, company network and then we have our customer network because if they sit on site with our customer or if they're using a laptop or things like that, they need to lock both terminals for security reasons. And the request came in was, is it possible to have a device that could lock both computers simultaneously with one press. So they didn't have to, they didn't want to go tap tap, but rather one tap and both would simultaneously lock up. And that was what was asked. I thought, I can't see why not, but it was a question of if it could be driven from one Pro Micro or not. And through discussions with people on Discord and the Australian uh, keyboard Discord, the consensus was it probably wouldn't work without a lot of you know different things happening because USB protocol is serial so it only talks to one device at any given point in time if I had a, a splitter cable of some kind no one was quite sure what was going to happen to that actual output and how it would communicate with the two different computers simultaneously so the consensus was it would probably be better and easier to simply set it up with two controllers, which is exactly what I've done below. And then it was a matter of, well, how do you set it up so that you're going to be able to trigger both devices correctly, simultaneously, without them shorting out, and depending on if you wanted one or both plugged in for whatever application, how would you be able to still have that happen? So some of the guys and I, we chatted about it, we dropped some, some line diagrams, and we came up with the general consensus that thing, this should work. So what we're talking about here is that you've got two Pro Micros and you've got an input and an output with diodes that prevent the closure of the switch from one Pro Micro triggering the other Pro Micro. So the actual triggering activity is happening with the switch rather than from any input outputs from the other Pro Micro, simply because of the way that you've got your diodes set up. So we thought, you know, that should work. There's no reason why it shouldn't work. And that's exactly what I've done to set up on my breadboard. So let's go back to the desktop. So what you can see here is I've got my Pro Micros with their headers soldered and they are jacked into the Pro Micro. And for ease and convenience, I've just flipped them around so that I can mirror their activity. I have to get my little pointing drill bit. <laughs> so I'm using pins B5 and B6 here, B5 and B6 at the back. And because they're connected rows and I've got my two halves across the actual ravine, it means they're not going to short out. If I plug the entire Pro Micro across one set, then it would short. Thankfully, I don't need to worry about that because it wouldn't even fit anyway. There's not enough rows, so I don't get a choice. It has to go across the ravine. And I've got these, these header cables. They just have like a, a very simple pin like that. And uh, yeah, they're designed for breadboard work. So picked up a pack of 100 of them, relatively cheap. 
I've got this pin here which is B6 connected to this wire and then this wire the yellow one loops around and goes out to the front which is then it shares a row with one end of the diode leg goes through the diode into that row which then is electrically connected to the white wire which the white wire jumps over to this side which shares the same leg as the diode as well and then I've got an alligator clip which goes to one side of my switch which I'm using here is a, uh, a navy, a box navy, a kale box navy for the clicky goodness. And then of course on the other side of the Promarco I've got a very similar corresponding setup which is this row shares it with B5 and it comes up and around and it goes to the diode leg through the diode back into the breadboard back through the black wire which goes across the other side and I've kind of got a mirror match going on with the second Pro Micro. So very simple circuit and in terms of the actual flashing because we want both Pro Micros to output the same thing we can use exactly the same hex as long as I've got my pin use correct on both and because it's a breadboard it's super easy. So what I've done is let's go back to the monitor I went to KLE, I went and grabbed one single button press, I got the raw data, just like I'm doing now, let's copy, I stick it into KB firmware, I paste it, import it, there's my single key. Now the pins, as I said, it was B5 and B6. Uh, now, I've already tested this and I know it works, but the mistake that I made was I had my diodes the wrong way around initially. So I set it to B5, and then I set it to B6, and then when I flashed it, and tried it, nothing happened. And then I thought, well, it had to be the diode, so I flipped all of my diodes 180, and it worked. And then what I did was I set the key map to just A, just for testing purposes, because I didn't really need to actually lock my computer, because then I wouldn't be able to tell what was going on if I had any issues. I put the settings, I saved it, I compiled it, I exported it into a hex, and then, of course, I flashed my Pro Micros with it. I flashed it with the same hex on both. So let's uh, plug it in. You can see that power is going to light up on one. And then, and in no way is this video sponsored by the manufacturer supplier that is on this USB cable. It's just what I had. But of course, if they ever see this and they want to, um, please get in contact with me, have a chat. It's just that I can't be bothered covering up that thing there. If you're overseas, you probably don't even know who they are. Okay, so both of these Pro Micros are set up. And let's switch over again to the monitor so you can see what's going on. Now, um, it's going to be a little bit tricky. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to spam some one so that it'll actually turn up. There we go. Okay, so that my camera isn't covering up the, um, the actual bits here that's happening. And so if I unplug one of these wires, right, just for the heck of it, well, actually, no, what I'm going to do is I'm going to unjack one Pro Micro. Okay, so you saw before that the both of them had lights on. So now only one's got a light on. The other one is not electrically connected. And if I, because I'm holding it up, check the screen, you see A is now outputting. Okay, so now if I swap that around and I unplugged the top Pro Micro and I plug in the bottom Pro Micro just for, for completeness. Uh, actually, I need that longer cable, don't I? Okay, so, because <clears throat> it won't lift up high enough if I use the short one. Okay, so, same orientation before. Now the bottom Pro Micro is connected, the top one isn't, and two hands, so I'm not cheating. I get an output of A as well. So we can see that each individual Pro Micro from the circuit works. And then of course now comes the uh, the fun part of demonstrating that both Pro Micros work without any problems. Uh, a little bit tight in getting that plugged in, only because of where I chose to alligator clip it. If I had actually put uh, another series of wires that hopped over from that to a different point, then I probably would have made my life a little bit easier. Okay, so now what I'll do is I'll actually 
angle the camera down somewhat, maybe. All right, I do apologize for the crotch shot, but you'll see both Pro Micros are lit now, and my hands are here. I'm not going to be cheating by using the keyboard, but if you check out what's going to happen along there, actually, I'm going to put another, I'll put two, just so that we can have a gap there. And you can see if I do the single press, I now get double A's kicking in pretty much. It's, it's so fast, it's so simultaneous that the computer is just dumping two A's and you can't even differentiate which one's kicking in before the other. So the theory is sound in that there would be no reason why it would not work if I plugged this into two different computers and the result was that on a single key press, I would get an A on both devices. And then of course, when I remap this to Windows plus L, it means it would send that out and it would cause both devices to Windows lock simultaneously. So, you know, it's a very simple project. It's a very simple device, but being able to test it without soldering, being able to, you know, problem shoot it, to just unplug stuff and move stuff around is super, super cool. It's lots of fun. It's relatively easy to, to play with. And, you know, it wasn't a very expensive exercise either. Short of me frying the Pro Micros and, and maybe killing the diodes if I had put in like a high voltage supply in here and then hooked it up to the circuit, you know, there was very little risk of anything happening in a, in a bad way. So there you go. There's an example of using a breadboard to design, develop, test a circuit. Um, if you want to be hand wiring and you're new to the game and you're trying to figure out hand wiring and stuff like that, breadboarding is also a really good way to do that simply because then you can electrically trace and go, okay, this is what's happening. This is connected to this. This is connected to this going to this particular pin on my circuit. And then of course, you know, your switch and stuff like that. So that's pretty much it uh, for this video. Thank you very much, of course, for checking it out. I hope that, uh, you know, anyone who's interested in actually playing around with electronics and learning about breadboards can do so. They're very cheap, they're very affordable, readily available, um, and yeah, lots of fun to play with as well. Now, we're still around the 1970 odd, um, not quite 1980 subscribers yet, but we're getting very, very close, super duper close to uh, our 2000 mark where we will be running that COSCAP giveaway. And for those people who might have just come across the channel, let me pull out what we're actually going to be giving away. So there's the official COSCAP authenticity card. So we've got an Idle Key 2 in Gilded Purity and a Robear in Werebear. Okay. And the actual caps, there is the Idle Key in the Gilded Purity, Purity, purple with gold. Bit of that skull and nuchal region happening from Coscaps. And then there's the Werebear with a bit of a, a pastel teal bluey with a greenish tooth and yellow highlight on the other eye as well. So thank you very much to Coscaps and Jolly Green Giant for making that giveaway possible uh, whenever it kicks off. So uh, please, if you're new to our channel, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that share button as well. Now, that pretty much sums up what's going on here for this week. I have been playing around with some other things, uh, including hot swap headers. If you haven't seen the video from the other week, I uh, went and purchased from the internet a lot of big fat hot swap headers for Pro Micros. So I've actually got two that are soldered and ready to be jacked in. Still have to design a case and print the case for that PCB to use it with it as well. Radio, And of course, if you have no idea what we do besides a YouTube channel, we actually have a podcast called The Board Podcast. It's a weekly podcast, of course, talking about mechanical keyboards. So if that's something to uh, interest you, whether you're cycling, walking, sitting in the car in traffic, on the train or whatever, and you want to just hear about two random people talk about keyboards, then uh, please go check that out at www.theboardpodcast.com. All episodes, entire back catalogue, completely free of charge, available all the time. And, of course, if you would like an invite to our Slack group, which you would have seen where that diagram 
schematic was shared previously as part of some of the discussions as well, just shoot me an email at theboardpodcast at gmail.com and uh, I'll be more than happy to send you an invite to come join us there. Thank you, of course, to everyone here for being our Patreon supporters. Really love and appreciate all of your support. Without you guys, you know, financing things like this and builds and other things that I do would be slightly more challenging. So, as always, really, really appreciate. And with that, I'm going to say goodbye. And of course, as always, until next time, happy clacking.